So welcome, Joan Osborne, to the first cut, and uh, congratulations on your new album, Trouble and Strife. Great new record. Thank you. Thanks so much. This is your 10th album. Yeah, I guess so. I lost track probably back at seven or eight, so I don't really, <laughs> really keep track of it so well. <laughs> right. I was uh, just reading a few things and didn't realize that it's been 25 years since Relish came out. Yeah, it has been, and um, we were going to do some shows that were commemorating the anniversary but then of course COVID happened and so now we're we're not doing that but uh but yeah it's uh it's been a while and I mean part of me feels like yeah it definitely feels like 25 years if not more and then another part of me feels like how could it have been that long ago because it just seems like last week so right. depends on the day. <laughs> I know and we still play the songs from that album you know as well as the new one, but they, they still sound great and still sound timeless to me. Well, we have some questions for you today. Mm -hmm. It's just a way for us to get to know you a little bit better through, you know, some of your, of your uh, first experiences, such as what was the first record you fell in love with? The first record that I fell in love with was the soundtrack to the sound of music, the movie with Julie Andrews. Um, mm -hmm. I was a little kid and my parents had this big giant console stereo, uh, which is like a big piece of furniture. And we had it set in such a way that I could sit next to the speaker and open the door of the cabinet that was next to it and make this little box for myself where I could hide away from all my brothers and sisters and all the chaos that was going on in my house and just sit there and play the record over and over and over again. And I used to, I used to play it and pick one person to to sing along with throughout the whole record. And then I'd get up and switch it over and pick another person and sing along with that person through the whole record. And I would just do this for hours and hours for a, a long, long time. So um, <laughs> I kind of feel like that was a way early in my life that I got used to harmony singing and got used to hearing those intervals. And uh, of course that's really served me very well uh, in my chosen <laughs> career path. <laughs> um, what's it like to hear that album now? When was the last time you listened to it, you think? Gosh, you know, I haven't listened to it in a long time. When my daughter, who is now 15, was younger, we would watch the movie sometimes. Uh, so it's probably been eight years or so since I've heard it, and I haven't listened to it recently. Um, but at the time, it was it was really gratifying for me to be able to sit with her and uh, you know, she was experiencing it for the first time. And of course I knew every word and every inflection and, and was, you know, would sing along a little bit sometimes. And she would sort of look at me like, Hmm, what's, <laughs> what's this connection between you and this lady here? You know, were you from a large family? Yeah, I have two sisters and three brothers. And uh, so I guess by today's standards, that's large. Although my dad was one of 11 children and my mom has a brother who had 10 children. So the, the big family thing is kind of a thing in our extended families. Yeah, you can see the appeal for Sound of Music because that was a big thing. <laughs> I remember wanting to be a part of that family so bad, you know. Mm -hmm. um, what was the first song you learned on an instrument? Um, you know, I had this piano, I, I started taking piano lessons when I was little. Um, I was probably five years old. And um, so I learned a couple of, you know, little beginner piano book songs. But my piano teacher had this enormous dog that, you know, my, my mom would drop me off at the piano lesson and I would have to walk from the driveway to the front door of my piano teacher's house. And this giant dog would come out and bark at me. Oh, no. And of course, the piano teacher was like, oh, he's just being friendly. Don't be afraid. But I was this little kid and I was terrified of this dog. So after about, you know, five or six lessons I was like no I'm not going back that's it so that was the beginning and end of my <laughs> piano career <laughs> wow ruined by a dog that's yeah terrible. by a big dog yeah <laughs> do you have a dog now of your own I don't although I would love to have one you know it's um we have cats and cats are a little bit easier if you are a traveling musician because cats are really about the house like as long as the house is there and someone's feeding them they kind of could care less whether you're around or not. Whereas a dog, it's about you, the person. So you can't just leave them. And uh, that would be very hard for us to do. Uh, although we did think about 
you know, once COVID hit and all of our tour was canceled, we did think about getting like a rescue dog and, and uh, you know, sponsoring it and taking care of it for a little while. But everyone was thinking that same thought. So when we went online to try to find one, they were all gone. Yeah. <laughs> what was the um, first song that you wrote? Yeah, the first song I wrote, uh, I think I was 11 years old and I was in the choir at uh, Anchorage School in Anchorage, Kentucky. And we had this amazing choir director, a woman named Carolyn Browning. And um, I think I really wanted very much to please her. Um, you know, she was very pretty and she was really smart. And I just, I think I had a girl crush on her. And uh, so I was trying to do things that would impress her. And I wrote this little song about, you know, spring and robins. And, you know, it was just it, probably really cute if you're 11, but probably just horrible when, you know, once you've gotten beyond that stage. Um, and she put it to music and had the kids in the class, you know, sing it. And oh. so I felt very special and, and very noticed by her. And, uh, and you know, I got what I needed from that. Um, so I, I really didn't write a lot of songs after that until I was much, much older and started doing music more seriously. What was the name of that song? Uh, it was called It's Spring Again. And, uh, you know... <laughs> okay. Yeah. You, you kind of could get it really just from the title. You know? <laughs> yeah, right. What was the first song you wrote that you felt proud enough or good enough about having it recorded? Mm. Well, let's see. I was starting to play shows in New York City and starting to really get into the, the music scene in New York City. And this was like the late 1980s, mid to late 1980s. Um, and I got, I got into this songwriting workshop with, uh, Doc Pomus, who of course is a great classic American songwriter. And he would host songwriting workshops in his apartment on West 72nd street in Manhattan. And I, a friend of mine told me about it. So I signed up for these workshops and, you know, started writing some stuff. And most of what I did was pretty terrible. And, uh, you know, he would gently, we, we would all, all the people who are participating in the workshop would bring in songs and play them for him. And then we'd do like a critique. And most of the things that I did were pretty bad. Uh, and he would sort of gently talk to me about why it was bad and what I needed to do to, to be better. Um, he was a very, very lovely guy. Um, and then there was one song called Wild World that I wrote. And that was one where he just kind of, you know, looked at me and said, yeah, that's actually, that's a song. And I just was sort of walking on air for the whole rest of the day. And I started doing that when I was performing in my shows in New York. And that ended up being um, part of a record, uh, the first record that I put out on my own indie label, which has since come out under the title Early Recordings. And so it's a song called Wild World and you can find it on Early Recordings. Oh, great. Was that a live album, Early Recordings? Yeah, or? yeah, yeah. A live record, yeah. Because mm -hmm. I think, <clears throat> didn't you have Son of a Preacher Man on that? Yep, had Son of a Preacher Man, had, it was sort of a mixture of things that I had written and uh, a bunch of covers too. Right. Um, Doc Palmas, can you name just a couple of songs that he wrote? He wrote well, he wrote Save the Last Dance for Me, uh, which- Speaking of Aaron Neville, who does it. Yeah, yeah. And he also wrote a lot of songs for Elvis Presley. Um, you know, he just, he's like a, an icon of American, you know, sort of classic American songwriting. God. You must have been walking on air just to have a compliment from him like that. Wow. Yeah. Um, what was the first heartache song you connected with? That's a really good question. Um, I think it was probably the Elton John song, Sorry Seems to Be the Hardest Word. Um, and I remember going to this party in junior high school and, uh, you know, I was not like a popular kid in junior high. So I was sort of hanging back and, and, you know, being a wallflower and looking at all the popular kids and they were playing this record of Elton John and that song came on and it just sort of like the other kids were kind of continue, you know, they were hearing it, but sort of continuing what they were doing. And I was just so, engrossed in the song and it just sort of took me over in that moment and uh you know I, I had not had any of those uh you know intense feelings of heartbreak or anything at that point in my life but 
I sort of felt like, wow, this must be what it really is like to be an adult and to have your heart broken. And I felt like that song was a window on that emotion for a little kid like me. Mm -hmm. um, what was the first artist you idolized, like really just were crazy about? Uh, it was Tom Jones. Mm -hmm. The first uh, artist that I just <laughs> completely was nuts about. And I was, I was seven years old. And he had a TV show, a TV variety show that came on uh, and it came on a little bit late at night. Um, and I remember, I think the first time I saw it uh, was maybe towards the end of the summer or it, it was uh, it was a time when it was staying light until late. And I remember watching that show with my family and I was completely sort of stunned by his voice and the way that he was dan would dance was just like, I mean, you know, I can look at it now and I'm like, dang, that's a really sexy dude. And at the age of seven, I was just like, my mind was blown. Um, so I remember watching this show and just being completely enamored of him. And then once the show was over, I went outside and it was still light out. And I just started running around the yard and, and just like I had all this energy and I just had to get rid of it somehow. And uh, I was completely in love with him. Have you ever have you ever met him? I have never met Tom Jones, no. But you know he can still sing like he used to sing, and he's a badass. He really is. I got to meet him once. And oh, it was really? Such a thrill. I was I turned into probably like you at seven. Mm. You know, I just wanted to run around the place. I was so excited. <laughs> and he was very gracious and really nice. And yes, he can still sing. Just amazing, mm. amazing guy. Um, what was the name of the very first band you played with? You know, I, I have been trying to think about that. I don't remember the name of the band, but I was, I was in a band um, in high school. Uh, my boyfriend at the time was a drummer and he was in a band and they were getting ready to play like a battle of the bands at Freedom Hall in Louisville. And they heard that I could sing. And so they wanted me to join them for this battle of the bands and sing like a Fleetwood Mac song or something. And, um, you know, so I, I kind of got drafted into this band and I cannot remember for the life of me what the name was, but it was a very short lived uh, time in this band because the bass player decided that he didn't like me. And, um, you know, I was 16, so I'm sure I was a jerk because most 16 year olds are a jerk. So I'm sure he had good reason, <laughs> but uh, he decided that he didn't like me and they had a big fight about it in the band and they eventually just kicked me out of the band. So oh. it was very, it was a very brief time. Okay. <laughs> what, uh, what record are you listening to now that you're really loving? Well, as a matter of fact, it's, I pulled this out because I wanted you to see the cover. Okay. <gasps> it's oh, yeah. this record right here um mm -hmm. which is just on so many levels it is amazing and just renewing my soul in moments when I really need it because you know if I'm a musician and you can look at it from the perspective of a, a musician and you know Ella Fitzgerald her musicianship is just unparalleled. You know, her, her instrument is incredible and what she can do with it is incredible. And then there's Louis Armstrong and he has, of course, a completely different instrument with his voice, this sort of ragged gravelly thing, but the way that he uses it is just, he's, you know, he's a genius, he's brilliant. And then he starts playing the trumpet and it just transports you. So, you know, this has really, uh, just as a musician, I appreciate it on that level, but then it's also just, it's just beauty. It's just so much beauty and it just washes over you with all this beauty and it really, really lifts my spirits these days. So this is the one that I, you know, I, I keep thinking I'm going to put it back in my record stack and then it just stays on the, the turntable all the time. How did you find that record? How did you end up? You know? um, this was something that my daughter and I uh, bought for my partner, Keith, for um, either Father's Day or his birthday or something like a couple of years ago. And, um, you know, she picked it out for him. And then the minute we put it on, we all just fell in love with it. So, you know, my <laughs> daughter loves this record. Everybody loves it. Get this record. You must hear it. It's essential. I agree. Yeah. What's your favorite song on there? Do you have a favorite? Uh, I mean, you know, the nearness of you probably is is the one that, you know, just 
knocks me out, but they're all amazing. Yeah. Um, what's the most recent song you've learned to play? Uh, the most recent song I've learned to play is the title track for my new record, Trouble and Strife. Um, I actually did not play it on the recording. Um, I just, I learned to, you know, I just wrote it on the guitar and then showed it to the guys in my band. And then they took it and made something much better uh, than I could have done with it. So I didn't play myself on the recording, but we did a show back in October. Uh, it's the only show that we've done since COVID happened. Uh, in front of an audience and it was in a big tent outside in Ridgefield, Connecticut. And I really wanted to do a bunch of songs from the new record. So I taught myself how to play Trouble and Strife on the guitar for that. Wow. Um, what's a heartache song you would go to now? Uh, I mean, I try not to go to heartache songs too much right now. <laughs> I think there's, I think life is, uh, you know, I mean, I understand that that it can be really helpful when you are feeling that uh, to have that reflected in music. Um, but I just, for me, I want to see comedies and I want to I want to hear beautiful, uplifting music. But if I did want to go to a heartache song, I think it would probably be uh, the Ray Charles song "You Don't Know Me." Um, I think it might've been a Hoagie Carmichael song who wrote it, Hoagie Carmichael. Um, but it's, uh, you can, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but it's just such a poignant and beautiful recording. And, uh, it, and I was showing my daughter, um, uh, the movie Groundhog Day, um, which of course is such a classic movie and one of my favorite movies. And I had kind of forgotten that that song is in the movie. And when it came on, it just was like, <gasps> Oh my God, I remember this moment and oh, this song is just so incredible. So it's, it's not only, um, you know, a beautiful performance, but the song itself is about this sort of unrequited love and uh, looking at this person that you're completely in love with and knowing that they don't have any idea and that they don't even know who you really are because you, you can't express to them how you feel about them. Mm, it is a great tune. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> What's a song that really lifts you up right now? Uh, well, I think the song that I'm most in love with right now is that classic Johnny Nash song, I Can See Clearly Now. Mm. Um, he actually recently passed away in October. And uh, I think it just was such a fitting tribute to him that a, a lot of the people who were celebrating in the streets when Biden's victory was announced um, were blasting that song uh, from, you know, I, I heard it from cars and, and out people's windows and stuff when I was sitting there in Brooklyn and we were like, what's happened? What's happened? And so we ran outside and, and joined all the, the people in, in their celebrations. And, and uh, I just feel like that's such a fitting tribute that a song, you know, that's that has been around for that long can be used in that moment of celebration. Well, Joan, thank you so much. It's great, uh, great to speak with you today. And thanks for doing this. You're so welcome. It was a pleasure. And best of luck through everything that uh, we're all going through right now. Yeah, for you too. Please be safe and tell everybody that you are, that's in your listening audience to really just better safe than sorry with this COVID stuff. You know? Absolutely. All right. Take care. Thanks again. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.